Okay, so I think we'll start now. Thank you for coming, everyone, and thank you for those who are joining via JBug Worldwide. Um, okay, so this is welcome to our second JBug Worldwide event. Um, this month we've got Aaron Gupta talking about uh, Java EE7 with 50 new features in 50 minutes. Um, before we start the main talk, I'm just going to bring up some slides about JBug Worldwide to tell you what we've got coming up. So I'll share my desktop. Okay, so first of all, uh, just a very quick overview about uh, what JBook Worldwide is all about. So the format is that we're going to host um, a series of informal and interactive <laughs> sessions um, at least once a month. Um, sometimes they'll be co-located with another physical JBook like we are today, and other times they're going to just be pure um, Google Hangouts. Uh, the idea is to have to try and get a, quality, uh, well, a high quality talk every single month covering a, kind of a broad area of, of interest for people and with also a, in between having some more niche talks um, as and when they're available. The, the concept has grown out of the uh, JBug Newcastle user group uh, where we used to broadcast events there as well uh, but now we're kind of bringing it and the brand forward with JBug Worldwide. It's, we're still kind of um, learning as we go at the moment, so we're really keen to get your feedback. So please, please contact us with any feedback you have, um, especially around you know the quality of the audio and video and uh, how you find the overall experience. Um, we want it to be a fun and entertaining session rather than sort of dry and boring. Uh, the main community lives at our meetup page, so the link is there, meetup.com slash worldwide. Okay, so what have we got coming up next? Uh, the next session is on Wildfly 8, and we, where we have the project lead, Jason Green, talking about what's new in Wildfly 8. That's on July the 8th. Uh, we hopefully will have a session uh, on the 19th of August as well, uh, but that's not been confirmed yet. So just keep an eye on the meetup page for that one. The, and then in October, we have a, course, a talk on Achillean by the project lead, Aslak Knutson. So that's a really cool um, integration testing framework that's getting a lot of traction at the moment. Um, also, we, there's another um, virtual user group that you may be interested in. So that's the, oh, I've called it, I've called it VJBug. I actually meant to call it VJUG. <laughs> so it's the VJUG sessions. Uh, they also have a meetup page. Um, they're a very successful user group, virtual user group on just Java, whereas we focus on JBoss technologies. Uh, their next session is on Java class loaders on Thursday, June the 19th. And the session afterwards is a panel session discussing the responses they got from a survey that was done by Zero Turnaround. And that'll be on Tuesday, June the 24th. Um, you can find them on meetup.com as well under VJUG. Uh, okay, so that's. That's all my slides I wanted to go through, so now we're going to switch. Okay, so as you can see, we're, we're um, broadcasting from, from a physical uh, JBook in Newcastle. And um, okay, so now this will start. So, Aaron? Aaron, thank you very much for joining us. So thank you. I'll, one moment. I'll just see. Okay, so Aaron, if you could just thanks for coming. Sure. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you for giving me an opportunity. Well, my name is Arun Gupta, and I work for Red Hat. Um, I joined Red Hat about eight months ago. Oh, actually, now uh, last year, uh, October, actually. Uh, prior to that, I worked for Sun. Um, for about 10 years and then four years about Oracle, came as part of Sun acquisition. I've been with the part of J2EE team. And notice I say J2EE, really going back to the very first release. I was part of that team. Um, I was responsible for driving the launch of Java E7 at Oracle. Um, that was like June 12th of last year. So I was also responsible for the worldwide evangelism of Java E7 around the world. As part of that, I wrote about 1,400 plus blogs. Um, and I spoke at all major Java conferences. 
um, about in 40 plus countries. Excellent, thank you very much, Alan. Interesting. Okay, and um, I guess you're ready to start your slides. Or? I'm ready. Ready. Okay. So let's share the slides and do rock and roll. So I see lots of me, and then I'm going to switch here, and that's the slides. <coughs> All right. So in this talk. Um, now, typically, this talk is given in about 50 minutes, and I realize we have about a little over 50 minutes, about about an hour. So we don't have to kind of rush rush through it, uh, but still, you know, 50 features in 50 minutes is that's a lot of features in there. So think of it as more as a breadth of Java E7. Um, we're not going to get into deep of any any particular um, topic, but still give you enough knowledge that you know if you want to scratch the surface under the hood, you can do that as well. Okay. So um, of course, I have a Twitter presence. Um, now, in terms of the format of the slides, you know, there are about 102 slides. Imagine a minute and 102 slides. But as I said, it's just the breadth that, that I've been giving you. Because what I've done is, in the general, uh, I've given talks on Jax RS like for one hour, or Batch for one hour, or WebSockets for one hour. So I can keep talking on Java E7 for two days. Uh, and But this is just one, one hour. So what we're going to do is uh, talk about the feature number first. Talk about which spec it's coming from, and then what's the feature it, it, it is. This is the J Java E7 pancake diagram. So you can see there's a platform at the bottom. Um, and then we go from the specs <clears throat> on the left to the one in the middle, and then on the right. That's the order I'm going to cover all the specs. So you can you know, kind of zone in, zone out, depending upon what particular specs are interesting to you. First thing we're going to start with is CDI 1.1, JSR 346. So 1.1 means uh, in Java E7, it became uh, from 1.0 to 1.1. Okay, This is JSR 346. CDI was quite a significant addition to the Java E platform. Um, and in that sense, you know, it really changed the, how the platform is going to work. Uh, but to enable CDI in Java E6, you still required a beans.xml file. That means without that beans.xml, you can put any CDI annotation and nothing would kick in. Now, with, um, first of all, with Java E7, CDI is enabled by default. That means you don't need a beans.xml, which is a good thing. Um, but if you don't need a beans.xml, which beans to be made available for injection? Then you're saying any CDI scoped bean would be available for injection. So that's one thing. Uh, but if you want more finer <coughs> granular control on your injection, <clears throat> then you can still have a beans.xml. And in the beans.xml, you can have this attribute called as bean discovery mode. And that could take three different values, which is all, annotated, or none. So annotated means all CDI scoped beans, just with the CDI annotation, will be available for injection. All means all beans will be available for injection. And none is your one point where you can turn off injection completely. That, OK, I don't want any injection in this war file to happen at all. So that's a finer scanning control as part of CDI. A new annotation added to CDI 1.1, which is vetoed. So you don't want a particular bean to be available for injection ever, um, maybe during testing phase, or you know, you like, okay, I'm just writing this bean, but I never want this bean to be injected. You can put at vetoed on that bean. Not only that, you can put at vetoed on a package info, and thereby disabling the entire bean uh, or entire package to be available from injection. So a single bean or an entire package can be vetoed out. All right, so um, CDI, by the way, was led by Red Hat. So that's one of the specifications contributed by Red Hat. Uh, bean validation 1.1, which is JSR 349. Uh, yet another specification that was led by Red Hat. Uh, in the first version, in Java E6, it was 1.0. In Java E7, it became 1.1. So what that means is, uh, <clears throat> In 1.0, when we introduced bean validation, it was only allowed to be used in, say, JSF and JPA. But now in Java E7, it's a lot more generically applicable. So what that means is, here I've got a POJO. In my POJO, I'm putting an annotation called as at not null. So literally in my constructor, I'm saying, when you are trying to create an instance of my bean, this algorithm should be not null. Um, if it's null, then I'm going to throw a constraint violation exception. So the beauty of this is, instead of in your code saying, if algorithm equals null, blah, 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 do all that logic, you can just 
put your constraint in there, and that's what we call as programming by contract. If the contract is not honored, it throws a constraint violation exception, and the class creating the constructor needs to handle it. It's a runtime exception, by the way. Similarly, you know, not just in constructors, but normal method parameters, you know, can start putting at not null or even in the return value. So truly, you know, your lots of if else's will disappear in that sense because you can start using these constraints in your uh, business logic. Not only that, but you can create your own constraints and put them in the exact same way on your business methods. Interceptors 1.2. Um, 1.2 means it went from 1.1 to 1.2. So once again, a minor revision in that case. Now, interceptors were moved out of EJB as part of Java E6. So they became a standalone specification. But in 1.2, the biggest addition was that now you can intercept a creation of a class itself. So here, for example, I have a logging interceptor, and I want this init method to be called any time a class is being created, you know, or instantiated using new. Okay. Um, so uh, remember, this is application managed uh, classes. So you got to call a constructor, and then instantiate a class for that. So when you do a new of that class, then this method will be automatically called. Earlier, this interception was only available for non-constructor methods. So this was kind of an afterthought, but at least it's available now. Another uh, feature added to interceptors was priority. So there was no place in the Java E specification by which you can say, here are my three interceptors, and put them in a certain order. Um, you just put them in a certain, and you put them, you know, you hope that you define them in a certain order in Beans or XML, and expect, or hope, rather, that your application server will pick them in the right order and put them, execute them exactly in the same order. But now, with interceptors, you can define certain priorities. That, OK, this is, uh, so if you say platform before, that means this is the highest priority for you. If you say library before, that's the second priority for you. Similarly, you can start defining priorities. The one with the lowest priority are loaded first. The one with the highest priority are loaded second. Kind of counterintuitive, but that's the way it works. And I mean, it really, but at least you can define the order in which your interceptors can be defined, or it should be loaded. Concurrency, uh, that is JSR 236. That's a brand new addition. 1.0 indicates it's a brand new addition to the platform. Now, in Java EE, you cannot add any user threads. You cannot spin up, say, a new thread, uh, because Java EE is a managed environment. And what do you mean by running your own threads in a managed environment? So then JSR 236 allows you to run allows you to spin up user threads, but managed by the container. And so basically, you have executor service, schedule executor service, thread factory. JSR 236 provides a managed version of all of those objects, which, 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 which are basically spin up by the container now. Um, and the biggest advantage is, uh, because you are le leveraging the existing packages in JDK, which is Java Util Concurrent Package, your same design principles are applicable for Java E container as well. So first example is, the first managed object is default managed executor. We know what, ma or we, we know what executor is. We got a managed executor now. So here I can say, um, instead of injecting an executor service, I'm injecting a managed executor service. Once I inject it, I get an instance of executor. I can inject it or I can obtain a Jindy reference to it. Say, this is my JNDI name for where the executor service is living, and then give me a reference to it. By the way, this uh, JNDI name is defined by default in the platform itself. So uh, there is one default managed executor that is available for you at all times. Or in your application, you say, what? One managed executor will not cut it for me. I need to define multiple managed executor. So let me kind of start putting them into my web XML and giving a specific resource reference type and then I can refer them back or inject them back in my application, giving that specific JNDI name. So manage executor is one. Similarly, there is a manage schedule executor. So I can say, um, um, inject a instance of manage schedule executor service for me. The difference between uh, manage executor and manage schedule executor is in manage schedule executor, you can start submitting tasks with a certain delay. So for example, you could say, execute my first task after two seconds of delay and then subsequently execute the task every three seconds. So you can start specifying your algorithms or cron tasks, so to say, 
which are all spun up in separate threads. Just like your manage executor here, uh, you can obtain a JNDI reference. Now, this JNDI name is automatically defined in the platform. Or you can define specific references to your managed schedule executor in WebXML. So here is an example. Um, once again, if you guys are using executor service and uh, schedule executor service in JDK, this would look very familiar. And what that means is um, you can literally say executor.schedule. So this is a task which will be spin up in a new thread every time. And you're saying, do this every five seconds. Here, do the first task at two seconds, and then every other task at three seconds. And these two particular ones, at fixed rate and fixed delay, have got subtle differences in their semantics, but they pretty much sort of do a similar job. The next object is manage thread factory. So this is very, very much like thread factory, but you can say, you know what, I'm going to create a manage thread factory. All the threads that are going to be created from this manage thread factory are going to be managed by the application server for me. So once again, uh, resource. JNDI reference. This is the J default JNDI reference defined in the platform. Or um, here, what you're saying is, once you get a factory, then from the factory, you can create a new thread. When you do this new thread, the thread that you obtain is now managed by the container, which was not possible earlier in Java E6. And to it, you can pass a task. Now, this is an application managed task. So you're really mixing your application managed task to be managed by a, a server managed thread. Uh, now, this thread has just one method, whether it's shut down or whether it's still running. But that's the only thread, only additional method that has been added to this um, managed thread factory. Now, we saw three managed objects. The fourth managed object is managed object is dynamic proxy. So this allows you to add contextual information to any, any POJO in your Java E environment. So for example, you can say, I want to pass my class loading, JNDI, security context information to a POJO which you may not have depending upon how you are spinning it up. So here, in this case, I could inject a context service. Once I inject a context service, then I can say create contextual proxy. You can specify a class. And here, you're saying, OK, I'm going to get a runnable back. So once you get a runnable, um, when you get, once you get a proxy here, to your contextual service, you can submit the proxy. So what you've done is basically, to this instance of my runnable, you have specified all the context information. Um, so that means in this my runnable instance, whenever you are doing a class loading that is happening in the container uh, class loader, whenever you are resolving a JNDI, it's being resolved as in the container is resolving it. All right, JPA 2.1. So 2.0 to 2.1, that indicates it's a minor revision to so JSR 338. Now, JPA, Java Persistence API, gives you the API to which basically models the object relationship uh, between a database and POJOs. Now, up until JPA 2.2, 2.0 rather, you could say, here is my database, and from that database, generate my JPA entities. That was possible. Now we are saying, here is my JPA, from that JPA, generate my database. And that could be done now for using Java X persistence schema generation properties. Um, not only you can say to generate your database directly, you can also say, don't worry about database generation, generate the scripts only. Or you could say, um, during deployment, you could hit out my scripts that are bundled with the war file, take those scripts, and generate my database schema already. So all of these additional properties are basically introduced in JPA 2.1, which allow you to be a little bit more dynamic as your applications go into the cloud. So for example, here I'm saying, uh, the script's action is drop and create. And I'm saying um, the script, the create, the script's create target is create.sql. So um, at the deployment time, it's going to drop and create the database. It's going to take this create.sql and generate my database schema. So that is my DDL. And then it's going to take this insert.sql and it's going to load my database. So literally, you give it the war file. There's no deployment script required. It creates a database table for you, and it generates your schema as well. Of course, uh, whatever your JDBC resource is pointed to in the persistence unit, it refers to that to do that generation. Now, because you are generating your database from your JP entities, uh, we didn't see that particular option, but because you can generate the database schema from JP entities, you can also start specifying what indexes need to be generated. 
So for example, uh, a primary key always has an index on it. You know? So in this case, for example, if I say um, ID generated value private long ID, that always has an index on it. But in addition, now I'm saying, oh, also generate index on ISBN and number of pages. Just a convenience thing. Um, because your uh, scripts are generated accordingly, your database is generated accordingly. In JPA, we have two types of persistence context. Uh, one is the normal one, which is like synchronized. That means anytime you write to the persistence context and it is part of a transaction, and every time the transaction commits, everything is written to the underlying data store, whatever the underlying data store is, whatever RDBMS you are connected to. There is an extended persistence context which can last outside your transaction as well, across multiple transactions as well. Now, with JPA 2.1, we added something called as a unsynchronized persistence context. That means this persistence context is not part of any transaction. You can keep adding values or keep crudding values in the persistence context, and you have to explicitly join or the entity manager, which is created using that, persistence context has to explicitly join the transaction in order to be synchronized with the database. So this is very useful, specifically in an offline mobile case. You know, you can have your persistence context on the phone, and it's not connected because there is no network connectivity. The moment you build the network connectivity, you say join the transaction, and everything is written to the data store. But of course, there could be synchronization issues. Well, that's why it's unsynchronized. In JPA, there was a capability to do named queries. So you can define, this is a convenience named query. Um, those named queries are pre-compiled, and you can start setting values in them. Now there is a capability to do the same mechanism for stored procedures, as, as a matter of fact. So here, for example, saying, this is my named stored procedure query. This is my convenience name. This is my database stored procedure name. And stored procedure can take in and out parameters. So you can start specifying all of those as part of your stored procedure query annotation. All right, JTA 1.2. Now, JTA specification itself was revved after a while, um, almost 10 years ago, actually. So, but a significant change. So now, with well, JTA, first of all, is Java Transaction API. It gives you the ability to do user-managed transactions. And that's what is being used in EJB to do container-managed transactions. So the biggest change in JTA 1.2, very significant change, though, is how you can do container-managed transactions outside EJB. So here, for example, I got a public class book rest service, um, and I got a persistence context defined over here, and this is a rest endpoint as well because of the path annotation and add post. Now I just want all methods in this rest endpoint to be transactional, so I can put add transactional annotation. Just by putting that single annotation, I'm making it transactional because my corresponding CDI interceptor bindings will automatically kick in, start, and commit or roll back a transaction at the beginning and the end of the method, respectively. So that's pretty cool. Now, let's say I don't want all the methods. You know, there's no need, for example, maybe to make my get as transactional if I'm doing using a REST endpoint, in which case I can just say, you know what, make my post, put, and delete as transactional. So in which case, I will not put add transactional here. I'll put add transaction on my individual methods. So only those methods become transactional. And then um, I can say uh, roll back on which particular exception. Don't roll back on which particular exception. So I can start specifying those attributes, which makes it very useful. It's very similar to EJB semantics, but now available in a POJO as well. And that's sort of the model that we're going with EJB anyway. Um, in the sense, let's kind of start splitting apart EJB. You know get security out of it, get transactions out of it, get scheduled out of it, see how we can split it out so that you know there is a lightweight CDI specification becomes a lot more core, and those annotations can be used anywhere on the POJO programming. <coughs> With JTA, we also introduce uh, CDI scoped annotations or uh, transaction scope. So here I can store, for example, any transaction scope data. And what that means is, this bean would be active or would be available for injection only if you are calling it within a transaction. So here, for example, I'm injecting two instances of book, book bean and book, book bean b1 and b2. I am explicitly beginning a transaction and committing a transaction. Now, the way CDI works, it says, oh, b1, b2, they're referring to the same bean. 
So I'm going to create two proxies, B1 and B2. But when the bean is actually asked for, I will find out what scope it is being asked in. So in this case, because you have started a transaction, it says, oh, let me see if there is a bean. So for example, when I execute the first B1.get reference, it says, let me see if there is a bean available in a transaction. It goes to the pool. No bean is available. It creates a bean over there and then gives that bean, puts it as a backing bean for the proxy. Second time, when you say B2.get reference, it says, OK, let me see what kind of bean it is. Oh, it's a transaction scope bean. But that bean already exists. So instead of creating a new bean, it just backs that instance with the same proxy. So effectively, B1 and B2 are pointing to the same proxy or same instance. EJB 3.2, minor, very minor release actually. Uh, for performance um, um, optimization, you may, wanna, may not want to passivate your state full beans all the time. It's just a tiny annotation over there. Or, uh, also, asynchronous and uh, non persistent timers are added to the web profile. JMS 2.0, uh, lots of additions over there. Um, so, for example, here, um, well, first of all, the API was heavily simplified. So here, uh, for example, I could say connection factory, I can create a context out of that. So this is um, a user managed JMS context. So this is a new object introduced, which is the entry point to JMS2. Then on the context, I can create a producer, send the message to the queue, and this is the payload. So one simple line. Now this code in JMS 1.1 is about 20 lines of code because everything is a checked exception and the amount of boilerplate code that is required to just implement this logic. So it's pretty mo monster, actually. Similarly, in consuming the code, you can say create consumer, receive the body, and string dot class. That's it. So very straightforward. Um, it's a very fluent API. So you can say create producer, set priority, set time to live, delivery mode. So you can build upon it, all of it. And just in one basically call, you're doing the entire logic of your entire consumption. Um, now, you can also, well, because Java E7 requires JDK 7, so we can use try with resources. So here, for example, I'm saying uh, connection factory, create a context for me. I don't want to close it explicitly because I'm putting it into a try with resources. So every time I get out of this try with resources block, the JMS context is automatically closed for me. So that's very convenient. Uh, same thing here. You now I got consuming the method here uh, or consuming the body. So I say context create consumer, receive body, and every time I get out of try block, it is automatically closed for me. Typically, when you are giving somebody to deploy your EJB application or a WAR file, you would say, hey, by the way, create this JMS connection factory definition for me. Now, this is a new annotation added to the Java EE platform where we are saying, oh, automatically create this connection factory definition for me. This is, by the way, referring to a topic connection factory. And this is my JNDI name. So at the deployment time, Java E7 runtime will automatically create this connection factory for you. Not just connection factory, but even the destination definition, whether it's a topic or a queue, what is the JNDI name for that, all of that is automatically created for you as well. So very convenient, you know, again, getting rid of your deployment scripts. Server 3.1, so 3.0 to 3.1 is sort of a minor addition. And as you recognize, JMS went from 1.1 to 2.0, so it's a major revision in that sense. In servlet 3.1, if you are doing <coughs> reading in a servlet, this is in a do get method, for example. Uh, if I'm reading in a do get method, then it's a blocking read. So I'm saying input dot read until it's minus one. Um, so you're literally blocked. And you're blocked until either the client times out or client stops sending data or something else happens because of which you get a minus one. So that's, that's sort of a greedy philosophy. Uh, now, the way we took care of that in Java E7 is on servlet input and output stream, we added new methods called as set read listener and write listener. It's a very standard design pattern where if you have some data to read, you read or write. If you don't have it, then you just spark the thread, make it available to others, and when you have it again, then you pull the thread back and use it and then get the job done. That's what this uh, uh, theory is here. So, for example, on We're jumping the gun. Hang in there. Right, okay. Yeah. So here I have a public interface read listener. 
uh, it says you know, on this I have on data available and all all data read. So those are the methods which says oh uh, this is now data is available call this method automatically or now you can actually write the data to the output stream now call this method automatically. So here uh, well this first of all works only for asynchronous servlets because otherwise in synchronous servlet you're anywhere blocked. That doesn't make sense to kind of park the thread you know you may park the thread in the server but the client is still holding an open connection to the server endpoint. So here what you're saying is I'm going to set the read listener and this is what triggers my internal thread which says oh I'm going to keep looking if there is you know, a, a request available or data to read then I'm going to call this read listener accordingly. Same thing with write listener. If there is an ability to write out to the stream then I'm going to call the write listener and otherwise come back you know, in the asynchronous server. Now in HTTP, there's a mechanism called as HTTP upgrade. And what that means is you can take a HTTP protocol, upgrade it from HTTP 1.1 or 1.0 to a non-HTTP protocol. And we use that, for example, in WebSockets. Um, we'll talk about WebSockets in a little bit later, but that capability basically comes from servlet specification. And in the sense that here we are saying, oh, uh, this is a general mechanism you can upgrade any servlet connection to a web connection and the web connection is basically giving you a servlet input and output raw stream. You do whatever you want to do with the input output raw stream and then you play around with it. So if, for example in case of web sockets this becomes a, a web socket input and web socket output stream for example. So or you, you have a web socket connection handler which is basically dealing with the raw servlet input output stream. Now this is where the mechanism is available but it's actually used in WebSocket today. There might be potentially other usages of it in the future as well. In servlet, um, now here, um, I have a method which is, um, so I'm saying my do get method is protected by an authorized constraint. So here I have my authorized constraint defined over here. Um, get is protected, good, so get is. But what about put, post, delete, and all other verbs of HTTP, that means all those, if you protect one method, by the way, all other methods becomes unprotected or uncovered, so to say. That's the terminology used in the servlet spec. So what that means is anybody can invoke those methods. So you're potentially exposing those methods. Not a good idea. So now servlet 3.1 added this single element, which is called as deny uncovered HTTP methods. By adding that single element in web.xml. By the way, this is only a web XML method, uh, web XML element. This is not an annotation. So by adding a single element, you're saying deny all uncovered HTTP protected methods. So you may be exposing get with a security constraint, but all others need to be explicitly exposed using a security constraint as well. All right, WebSocket 1.0. So this is DSR 356. This is a brand new addition to the Java EE platform. So what does WebSocket enable you? WebSocket gives you a full duplex bi-directional communication over a single TCP. Now HTTP has three inherent issues, limitations, problems, however you may put it. Now DARPANET you know, or ARPANET, the way it was defined like what more than 50 plus years ago, 1969 or so, when the DARPANET was originally defined, its purpose was to share information you know, among a predefined set of computers. And that eventually evolved into HTTP and that's how the technology has evolved. Nobody thought we will ever be using DARPANET, so to say, for thousands of concurrent connections. So it would be unfair to say these are limitations of HTTP. So it would be more like, you know, we never saw this usage of HTTP coming along. But in all honesty, the three limitations, so to say, of HTTP first is, is inherently a client-driven protocol. In the sense, client sends a request, server processes it, and responds, responds back. There is nothing from the server to say, oh, I got some data, and I'm going to send it back to you. There are hacks, comets, uh, reverse Ajax, but those are all hacks. 500 libraries have 700 different ways to achieve those hacks. So there's no standard for doing that. So it's single directional. Second is, it's not full duplex um, because at a given point of time, a client is talking to a server or server is sending a response to a client. There is no way for client and server to talk to each other at the same time. And last but not the least, in HTTP for each HTTP connection, you build a brand new TCP connection, 
and when the response is received, the TCP connection goes away. From the application perspective, at least, yeah, there is HTTP pipelining and all those things, chaining and all those things, but application cannot rely upon any of that because that's very infrastructural level concept. So that's where H uh, WebSocket shines very well. It's full duplex because client can talk to server and server can talk to client at the same time, independent of each other. It's full duplex because both, uh, well, it's bi-directional because client and server can talk to each other. And the best part is, when your existing HTTP connection is upgraded to WebSocket, the TCP connection kind of stays open. And when the connection stays open, the client and server can do infinite amount of message exchanges, hypothetically infinite amount of message exchanges, until one of them says, OK, I quit. And then the termination is closed. So <clears throat> that's sort of the biggest advantage of WebSocket. Now, how do you do WebSocket-driven application in Java E7? Well, this is your fully functional canonical chat server written in Java E7 in about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines, OK? And how, how, how would you do it? So here, I got a chat server. I got a simple at server endpoint annotation saying this is the URI where my WebSocket endpoint is listening. And WebSockets can send or receive text and binary data. So if you receive text data, then you're saying define your method to have a signature like string. If it's binary, then it's byte buffer or byte array. Um, and then I'm saying this business method needs to be called whenever I receive a text data by putting add on message on it. And session basically says the conversation between the client and the server. Okay. So essentially, every time I receive a chat message in this particular method, I'm going through all the open sessions on this server and broadcasting the message to all the clients. Okay. So that's sort of the advantage over here. Very simple, very canonical, but that's how you would do it in Java E7. Now, not just add on message, but you have methods where you can receive when a connection is open or a connection is closed or an error is thrown. Those are called the WebSocket lifecycle callback methods. Those are all available as well. <clears throat> now, we talked about there's a client and a server talking to each other, which essentially become peers. The client and server does become peer, but there's a server at the center, and there are multiple clients that are talking to the server. These clients are not really peers to each other. They're all talking to each other via the server. So, But there's still a client endpoint that is listening for a request from the server. So that is defined by using at client endpoint annotation. Now, once you have a client endpoint, you got to connect it to a WebSocket server, which is done using give me the WebSocket container, connect to the server, provide the class in, client class instance, and the WebSocket URI where your endpoint is listening. Now, WebSocket endpoints are available using WS colon slash slash protocol, not HTTP colon. What we saw was a annotated endpoint, uh, WebSocket endpoint. Uh, there is also called as a programmatic endpoint. So here, for example, I can say chat server extends endpoint. I mean, the first feeling that comes when you look at this, like, oh, this is too verbose. Well, it is intended to be verbose because uh, it gives you a lot more knobs and dials and how you can configure your data. So for example, here I'm saying uh, I'm going to override this method on open. So every time this chat server is opening a connection, open this method. And here I'm going to set up a message handler where I'm receiving the whole, not just partial, but whole string. So that means this is a text-based message handler. Um, I can similarly override other methods. I also got an endpoint configuration class here for me. This endpoint configuration allows me to configure certain aspects of the endpoint. The idea being convention over configuration. If you like convention, stick with the annotated endpoint. If you want to change configuration, you, if you want to change the endpoint using configuration, use the programmatic endpoint. <clears throat> now, in this programmatic endpoint, we did not specify the endpoint address. That needs to be specified using uh, by implementing server application config. So your Java E7 runtime will scan your war file, pick up all the server application configs, and find out, oh, let me deploy these um, WebSocket endpoints. So here, for example, I'm returning a server set of server endpoint configs, where I'm saying, this is my endpoint class, this is my WebSocket URI, and this is my configuration class. <clears throat> now, my configuration class here is extending server endpoint config dot configurator. And this is where I can start specifying how many endpoint instances should be made available. You know, how can I modify the handshake? That is the original 
HTTP upgrade that is happening. So all those tweaks can be done in these classes. <clears throat> With WebSocket, as I said, you receive a text or a binary data every time. Now, you may not want to deal with the raw data every time. You may want to convert it to your business domain object and deal with that instead. And again, <clears throat> you don't want to do that every time. You may want to put that code of converting your text data to business domain object at one particular class or in one particular method. That's what this decoders and encoders do. They essentially take your text, convert it into business domain object, and vice versa. And you can specify them as part of your WebSocket um, server endpoint annotation. So here, instead of receiving string, I'm receiving chat message. And the decoder says, I'm going to decode text, and I'm going to give you a chat message. So I'm going to decode text, which is a string. I'm going to give you a chat message. Similarly, encoder says, I'm going to encode chat message and give you a text. Okay, so Encode chat message and give you a text. Because eventually, on the wire, what goes is text or binary. So it has to be that. But at least it gives you the ability and flexibility on how you can use that as within your application domain to be more in your in your business language. EL 3.0, uh, JSR 341 is a brand new addition to the platform. Well, not really brand new in the sense that EL was always existing as part of Java server pages. It was also used in JSF. So now EL is a standalone specification. So the idea is uh, you have this concept of EL processor. You can take a brand new EL processor, spin it up, and you can say, uh, using that EL processor, I'm going to write my configuration file, which will do EL resolution or expression language resolution. And I'm going to resolve a particular bean to a particular class name. You can start defining those algorithms. Um, and that's, that capability is basically available. It's not just limited to JSP or JSF. You can use that for your configuration files as well. JSF went from 2.0 in Java E6 to 2.2. So sort of two version jumps. There's, there's some neat features here. <clears throat> now, JSF 2 allowed you to do facelets-based programming. That means you could do XHTML and CSS uh, in your front end with your model and controller in the back end using EJB, CDI, JPA, whatever you want. But what was missing is if I want to have a set of JSF pages like a shopping cart put together as a flow. Shopping cart, address, credit card, checkout, detail, seven pages together, and the corresponding backing beans together. I got to define my own convention on how do I package them. And then I can't share them. Now JSF defines a standard way by which you can share them. So here I'm saying I want to define a faces flow. Um, whatever the directory name is, the entry point to the flow is the same name dot xhtml. And then you can click around the button and then exit out of the flow any way you like. Or you can say, I don't want to have flow 2 dot xhtml, but I would rather define my flow in flow 2 dash flow dot xml. Okay. So in, you can declaratively define how what your flow entry or exit point are going to look like. So there are different ways by which you can do that. There is a flow scope annotation by which you can define, you know, oh, I'm going to store all my flow scope data in that bean because this bean's lifecycle is tied to a flow scope. And you can also do your flow definition programmatically. So you can start defining, oh, uh, I don't know what all pages are going to exist. So I'm going to add runtime, figure out what my flow is going to look like. Uh, some EL expressions that you can use in your page, whether you are in a flow or not in a flow, and things like that. JSF, uh, one step short for uh, reusable contracts. So for example, with JSF, you can say, uh, I, you can truly do sort of MVC within the Java E domain. So you can say, this is my model in XHTML, CSS. V and C are sitting in the background. But what you couldn't do is, I want to apply a consistent look and feel across all my web applications. So that's when you say, oh, by the way, now with this resource library contract, I'm going to bundle all my XHTML, CSS, and templates in a jar file. And I'm going to package that into my WebNF lib. Better, I'm going to package them into a location that is accessible to my entire app server lib. And then the webs, my web applications can then access that jar file. So now in this case, this is how my jar file looks like. So in my um, in my 
web application I have a XHTML page all I'm saying is contracts equal red now if I go back here this is contracts red and this is contracts blue so whatever name it is you specify that contract and your style your template everything is coming from that uh, particular jar file so literally you can start putting common look and feel in a jar file putting it into a common uh, application server library directory and all applications can refer to that to provide a consistent look and feel another feature added in JSF 2.2 is how HTML5 elements are rendered now the way JSF elements are rendered is so you say you say h colon input text and you say type equals email it says goes back into your UI component the corresponding backing class it says, oh I don't know what type equals email and there is no corresponder corresponding HTML render kit so I'm going to ignore this element I know this is input text input text is type equals text and that's what it generates here now with JSF 2.2 you can say Never mind, this is a new element, but put it in a p colon namespace. Now p colon namespace, p colon is just a random prefix. You can choose whatever prefix you care about. But it basically is a prefix bound to pass-through namespace. Okay. So you're saying I'm gonna put this element in the pass-through namespace. What that means is JSF, you don't know about this element, don't worry about it, just pass it as is on. So it basically passes type equals email as is. Now my your render agent, which is my browser, renders it correctly because it understands you know this HTML5 element. So JSF is not becoming sort of a potential bottleneck in rendering your HTML5 elements. I don't know something to be excited about, but JSF finally has an upload file upload component. JAXRS 2.0. Now it went from 1.1 to 2.0. Um, JAXRS traditionally has always been focused, or 1.1 has always been focused on server-centric API. So you take a photo, put an annotation, and it's published as a REST endpoint. Now with JAXRS 1.1, you can say, or 2.0 rather, you can say, I'm going to build a new client. So I'm going to say client builder dot new client. On that client, I'm going to set a new target. This is my URI. I'm going to build an invocation object. This is the media that I want on the wire, and I'm going to invoke it. I'm going to get a response back. So you can do intermediate objects, or you can say, I'm going to do a Fluent Builder API. So client Builder, new client, target, request, get, all of that. One call, and you're invoking a REST endpoint that is hosted. Any REST, I mean, any REST endpoint is no way tied to JAX RS in that sense. Or you can say, I don't care about the on-the-wire media type, so I'm just going to say build a request. Give me the response back as string. So it's uh, type size as well. The JAXRS client API also supports asynchrony. So you can say client builder dot new client, target request, and in between you add async call here. Just by doing async, you are not receiving the response back as is. You're getting a future of response back. Future is a standard JDK API by which you can get, cancel, all those commands over there. Uh, JAXRS also adds support for asynchrony on the server side. So here, for example, you can say, um, I'm going to suspend the code as soon as I receive the call, and because this is an async response, um, and then I'm going to resume the invocation in a separate thread. Now, here what I'm using is a user thread. So that's not the right example. This should really be using sort of the JDK or managed schedule executor to spin up a new thread. Now, this is one area of the JAXR spec which is kind of a little rough, in my opinion. It's not very usable. So hopefully they'll address that in the next version of JAXRS 2.0, a simpler, cleaner programming model. JAXRS also defines message filters. So there's a client, there's a server. On each side, there's a request response and request response. That makes it four interception points for JAXRS filters. Filters are useful for uh, request headers and uh, request and response headers, basically. So you can see, Client request filter, server request filter, server response filter, ser client response filters. Those are four interfaces. You implement those interfaces depending upon what you want to deal with, where do you want to deal with these those headers. So in this case, I'm implementing client request filter. I get the method and the URI that is being invoked. Simple. In addition, we also have interceptors. Interceptors are dealing with the method bodies itself. In certain cases, you may want to deal only with the headers. In certain cases, you may want to deal with the body. 
Now dealing with the body itself may be a slightly costly operation because it may require binding to a database or whatever. I mean, doing some business logic or waiting for some resource to be read. So you ha that's why it was split up between interceptors and filters. Um, a typical uh, use example of interceptors is you may want to gzip. Say for example, you may want to read the headers and then based upon that, dynamically put in your interceptor where you could say, oh, I'm going to gzip or ungzip the body content accordingly. JSON P 1.0, brand new addition to the platform. So here, um, now JSON adds two versions. You now in J XML land, there is JAXP or Java API for XML processing and JAXB, Java API for XML binding. JAXP is a lower level API, JAXB is a higher level API where on a POJO you can put an annotation and somebody else figures out the rule for you, how the two-way binding works. JSON-P is a lower level API. In the lower level API, again, you have two approaches, which is an object-based approach, where you can say, I'm going to manually handcraft my object. So I'm going to create object builder, add a name value, add a name value, another name value, name, and the value being another object. So I'm going to build the object magically by my hands. And here, um, then this is a parsing approach or a streaming approach where you can say, I'm going to parse the element, parse the JSON structure, and as I'm parsing the structure, I don't want to read the entire structure in the memory. I want to read it. I want to read. Uh, I want to be notified when a certain um, event is happening, an event being object uh, or, or start of an object, end of an object, start of an array. Those, those are my events. So in this case, for example, all I'm looking for is JSON parser dot event dot key name. So let me know when the event is key name. Skip everything else. So it's a lot more efficient reading of the JSON structure. So if you have got a small JSON structure, read it in object model. Bigger JSON structure, read it in event based model. Batch 1.0 JSR 352 was a brand new addition to the platform. Now, in batch, the primary processing style, and I'll talk about secondary a little bit later, but the primary processing style is think of a CSV file that you receive at the end of the day. That CSV has probably thousands of records. All you want to do is process those records one by one, validate them, and actually process them to a database. Very simple, very canonical use case. So what you would do is you would read an item, you would process an item. You would read an item, you would process an item. For each read, you may not want to write. So you may want to say, I'm going to read, process, aggregate. Read, process, aggregate. You do that chunk number of times. Okay? And then once you have reached that chunk size, you write it out. So you're reading from a file stream, you're writing out to a database stream. You could read from a JMS stream, write out to a REST endpoint. Any combination is possible. So here, you now would have been better if it was animated, but PDF doesn't allow animation. So here, uh, each batch job is defined using a job specification language. So I have like my job specification language defined as XML here. So I say, this is my step. It is a chunk. My item count or my chunk size is three. I got reader, processor, and writer. Reader is implementing item reader. And in this case, I'm just reading an account using JPA. And it gives me an object back. This object comes to my object over here, where I can process it in my account processor. Okay, um, I could read an account and return a statement. Two completely unrelated, not necessarily unrelated, but two completely different objects. And then eventually, whatever statements are returned are aggregated in my list parameter here, where I write them out to the stream. So that's the way the flow works. Now this is my secondary processing style in batch, which is not the preferred processing style, where, where you're doing an ad hoc job. So like you know, one time job is um, upload a file or send an email or things like that. Now you have a batch job XML uh, where you can where you have a step where you're defining chunk. Now you can start defining listeners at all different levels. You can Define listeners at your job, at your step, at your chunk, at your reader, at your processor, at your writer, all of those different levels. Before and after, you can start defining listeners in case you want to initialize the resources or do some logging or clean up the resources. All of those listeners can 
can be um, easily implemented. And for each of them, there is an interface and there is a corresponding abstract class. So for example, here, I have my job listener that extends the abstract class. And there's a before job and an after job. So very simple uh, methods. You just implement them and do the thing that you really care about. Now let's say you're reading a CSV file, which has got thousands of records, say a million records, and you're running it on a four core machine. It would be unfair if you're using only one core. So now declaratively, you can start splitting it up that reading of resources across four different cores. And the way you do that is to your reader, you specify start and end property. Okay. And in your batch XML, you say, I'm going to split this into two partitions. Partition 0 will have a start value and an end value. Similarly, partition 1 will have a start and an end value. So 1, 10, 11, 20. This is a tiny file, 20 records, but it's split up across two cores at least. I'm doing this declaratively, and that's the beauty of the batch, pro batch programming language. But you can do this programmatically as well. So programmatically, you'd figure out, oh, I'm running on so-and-so server. We've got so-and-so cores. Now let me spin up, uh, define how the partition is going to happen. Batch programming language also allows you to create workflows, which is basically putting the elements that execute together as a unit. So here, for example, I'm defining a flow which has these two steps. So I'm saying, oh, make sure this flow executes first. And after this flow is executed, the next step is going to be step three. By default, it says step one, step two, step three, step four. But here saying, make sure step one and two conclude, and then do step three. Or you can say, you can do concurrent execution of flows as well. So you're defining two flows, and then you're saying, run them concurrently. So all sorts of you know fancy workflows can be easily done using batch programming. Not fully comprehensive, but still pretty fancy. Here's another way by which you can customize you know, between sequence, uh, between steps, flows, and um, splits. So here, for example, um, let's see this. So I have a step where I'm saying this is my logical step. I'm saying the next step is decider one. So I go to decider one over here. Decider one is a decision element. Uh, where I'm saying reference is my decider. My decider is my logic, business logic over here done programmatically. And in here, when I say, when I override this method decide, it gives me the list of step execution, which is the list of all the steps that are being executed. Then based upon that, I can make a decision what status code to return. And in here, so um, basically what happens is you execute step one, whatever is in there, in the next is decider one. In the decider one, it comes over here. It returns a certain status, either data loaded or not loaded. And then based upon that, you can say, if status is data loaded, go to step two. If status is not loaded, end the stop. So you can start doing some sort of workflow mechanisms in JSR 352. Java Mail, um, not a huge load of additions, but primary ones being, uh, you have simple uh, annotations by which, again, you can get rid of the scripts. So all these session definitions could be easily added. JCA, again, the same thing. Connection definition um, can be easily added using annotations itself. In Java E7, most likely when you're doing a web-based application development, you are doing, you're building a, a database-driven application. If you're building a database-driven application, the goal is to kind of keep the bar low. What do you have to figure out in an application server specific way? What is my JDBC resource? How do I create this JDBC resource? So there you go. Now we have a standard uh, Java colon comp default source or, or data source. Every time you run up a Java E7 application server, there is a default data source that is available to you. It could map to whatever the default application server database is, but at least the data source is there for you. Similarly, there's a default JMS connection factory. And similarly, all these default manage objects. Now, one thing I want to highlight is this is JBoss user group, all the more important. Uh, Wildfly is a Java E7 compatible application server. So if you're using or if you need any Java E7 capabilities, that's where you want to use Wildfly. Uh, Glassfish is a reference implementation, but that's where the buck stops. It is purely for reference. Um, not, I mean, Oracle is not support, providing commercial support on it at all. They have killed the commercial support on it. In Oracle's favor, they want people to migrate to WebLogic. 
but literally migrating from glassfish to weblogic is like migrating to a completely different application server um, they don't share any code base they claim so they don't share any code base um, minimal you know well, the management team is sort of similar but there are two different beasts altogether glassfish particularly was very lightweight weblogic is one monolithic monster um, their so called developer version is at least 200 megabytes where full blown wildfly is 120 megabytes which you can actually use in production by the way the advantage of going with wildfly is once you go with wildfly you get your full blown java e7 features in there and then when you are ready to go into production there will be eap7 jbus eap7 whenever it gets released so you can actually say you know what hey i built my application on wildfly it looks very good let me know when the production is ready when eap7 comes out you just fail over to eap7 and that's slick right there itself now this <laughs> this uh, talk was originally presented by me and Antonio Goncalves, who is the DevOps France and Paris Jug leader. We both have written books on Java E7. So the 50th, 50th tip was read these books. <laughs> um, and if you are interested in buying an online copy, let me know. Uh, I got a 50% discount code for this. Um, the real way I learned the technology, even though I was leading the team for Java E7 at Oracle, working with all the spec leads, all the engineers. But the real way, and I will show you here, for example. I go to this GitHub project. And if you look at this Java E7 samples, this is where. Uh, chunk of the work is there. You know, so you want to learn about any Java E7 technology, you find all the latest and greatest details over there. So you want to find out about web, WebSocket, for example, you click on WebSocket. So there are 30 plus samples just on WebSocket. You want to learn about JAXRS, so click on JAXRS, and there are 25 samples on JAXRS. So there's a variety of samples that are there on Java E7. Um, and the best part is, very community driven. So there are 1,000 plus commits. There are 33 contributors. Um, send a pull request. These are samples. These are tests run using Arkelion. Um, Paul talked about that briefly earlier this earlier today. So uh, you can learn Arkelion from here and ask tougher questions to Aslak actually when he shows up at the JBug meetup. Um, that's all I had, I think. Yeah, Wildfly is the hot. Java E7 application server. Do we have some questions? Let's switch the microphones over. Okay, so any questions for anybody in the audience? Yeah, I have a few, so <laughs> I can ask a question while you're thinking. So, um, um, yes, one of the things with Java E6 that bugged me was that um, the using CDI only works in certain places. So, for example, you need know, to use that in, in a Bojo, for example, or a managed bean, essentially. And, but things like web services, like if there's a Jax WS web service, you couldn't use it on that. Because the spec lead said that, well, a Jax WS web service is really just a wrapper on a server, but it doesn't belong on a server. So, for example, if you want to use the intercept organization, it wouldn't work there. And so it was fine if you understood that, but as a developer, it was very frustrating because you knew, well, I want to use an inset, but I'm not sure. Can I use it here? Can I not use it there? Oh, it's not working. Is that because I've not set it up right? Or is it because it just doesn't work there? And you have to be very mindful about where things will work. So I remember during the, um, when they were uh, planning this Java 7, there was talk about literally making the CDI work everywhere. But I don't know what happened with that. Did that, was that happen? I don't think Jax WS even supports it now because, see, in JSWS, there's a concept of interceptor as well. Uh, and that, to me, is a source of confusion right there itself. There has always been a source of confusion. Now, for example, if you do session, there are three session classes in Java E7. There is a Java mail session, there is a JMS session, and now there's a WebSocket session. So, and come on, and that is a pain point. Now, we talked about that at DevOps UK as well uh, last week. That to me, that gives a feeling that the spec leads don't talk to each other, mm -hmm. and they don't say, you know what, I don't care about it. This is my silo. This is my area. And like, that's it. I'm done. I'm not going to talk to you anymore about this. 
this is how I think this is the right thing. And I think that that definite and, and that is a much broader Java EE question, not just TDI question, because that to me is the value proposition of Spring. Because you know, even if this is a benevolent dictator, one person running the show, say what well, that's the how it's gonna be, that's that's the right cohesive way of the platform. Java EE does not give that cohesive view of the platform. Because they're independent specifications well, exactly. are with with some uh, some umbrella that yeah. puts it all together, but right. still if they do feel like individual silos very much. Exactly, exactly. And I think that needs to be fixed. Yeah. That needs to be fixed. So if you have a list of issues like that, by all means, um, let me know. I pushed out my notes from the DevOps UK earlier today in my blog. Uh, let me know. Let's make a list of those issues. Send it to the Java EE expert group. Take care of this. Or work with Jason. And Jason is our rep on Java EE. I know a bunch of those people. I've worked with them all, all along all these years. I'll reach out to the rest of the people who care about it. Yeah, yeah I've, I've seen quite a few people complaining about it. You know, and I was searching. I was trying to understand the problem at the time because I didn't know where it should and shouldn't work. Yeah. And I was bumping to people all over the place. You know, yeah, if you have a list of those issues, by all means, you know, let me know. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll go poke people in our doors on that. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Thank you. But just, can we just minimize your own screen because Hangouts is clicking back and forth. It shouldn't be happening on the broadcast. It just does it. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's probably distracting our local audience. It's <laughs> There you go, that's better. So, any other questions before I ask my next one? <laughs> Off the floor, okay, well, question number two. Um, so, um, what's the plan for Java E8? Yeah, Java E8 dates that we are hearing is more like 2016. Um, mid to late 2016 is what we are hearing. Um, so the specifications that are in target are JMS 2.1. That is a one look good looking one. Uh, then there's a configuration JSR we are hearing about, so which is going to be filed hopefully soon. There's a JSON binding that we're looking at, hopefully, well, hopefully to be filed before Java, Java 1. Um, hopefully JCash is going to be part of it as well. Um, let's see. Jigsaw. So is Jigsaw going to be there? In no, Jigsaw is 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 a is a bigger is a bigger beast from Java SE. So sorry, will that be ready in time? No, no, just no. making use. Jigsaw has been postponed 37 times and probably will be postponed 97 more times okay. before it actually comes to life. I don't ex have any expectations of Jigsaw. No. Let's not even schedule Jigsaw in our planning at all. That's right. going to be you know be beating around the bush. So no, let's be pragmatic about it. I've seen it failing so many times. Right. And uh, Oracle probably has a bigger fish to fry. So anyway. They should just do what? Just use JBoss modules. Hey? They should just do what JBoss modules us. Uh, <laughs> now we're getting into a political battle. I know, I'm only yeah. joking. I'm yeah, only yeah, joking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody will talk about OSGI then. So. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, but those are sort of the candidates that we're hearing all along. Uh, there's a talk about doing server sent events. There's a talk about doing uh, model view controller. So, um, and there's a Java E8 survey that I can bring up here. Is that looking good? Survey. Can you share your screen? Oh, I'm not sharing the screen. Okay, let me share it again. <coughs> if you look at the community survey here, these are the results from the Java EE community survey was done. So here, for example, which of these APIs do you think is important to be included into Java EE? So Jcash, data grid, state management, I don't know, people really care about state management. Identity, I don't know, too much about identity. JSON binding, yes, configuration, big words. Um, Java, uh, this, this is a very comprehensive list. Hold on, I was looking for something else. This one, this is what I'm So here you go. So now if you can see here, so you can see here, so this is JSON binding. This is security simplification because security model is just terrible, terrible. You know, JASPIC and JAZZ and like, ugh. that's why I'm going to use Spring security instead. Is looking pretty good. Um, security interceptor, so basically getting security out of EJB 
Um, MVC is a big demand. Um, how I can say JAX RS, uh, REST endpoint with the MVC over there. Uh, configuration, no JSR, this is looking pretty good. Um, management monitoring API, this is sort of a DevOps API. Not a full blown support for cloud based efforts, but at least some API, a standard API to do management monitoring. Now, JSR 88 was deprecated, which was for management. I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, support for an embedded Java E container, you know, because we sort of did the job in EJB, sort of an embedded EJB container, but there was a job half done, really. Not even a half done, it was a crappy job, frankly. Um, but now it's saying, let's take it full blown, provide a full blown Java E container where, for example, one of the wonderful suggestions was why can't I say, here is my war file, take my war file, go deploy it in an embedded container, you go figure out my dependencies, what needs to be started. And you go start it. Don't tell me, oh, here's my embedded container. I need servlet. I need this. And keep the bar low. You go figure out. You do some work. You go figure out containers that need to be started. You do whatever introspection needs to be done, and then get that jo get that job done for me. So I, I particularly like that one. Server sent events. And nobody cares about cloud. You know, there's still a war, lot of war going on between vendors over there. Uh, EJB timer move that out of EJB. Put it into CDI. Um, and there's no standard logging API. So that's sort of at least the community feedback, how much of it Oracle follows and they're going to do it. Because the way, in all honesty, the way these things work, um, they actually boil down to resources. Um, to, to give you a very specific example, in the batch API, there was the, the APIs were very genericized. So if you look back on the slides, for example, here, So if you look here, for example, <clears throat> you'll see that this is a read item. Why this is a generic object? Why can't this be account? Why can't this be account? And this could be statement. Well, if you look at batch specification point 8, or I think point 9, it actually has generics. But it was literally pulled out at the last minute out oh, because the implementation team couldn't implement it. It eventually boils down to resources. How much resources do you have? Oh, never mind. We can't implement it. Just yank the feature out of the spec. That to me is a fair decision, actually. It's not a criticism by any, any means. Because you know what? There are so many people. How many of you contribute to open source projects? That's a pretty big, pretty big percentage here, actually. It's not that typical, actually, by the way. So that's the reason, you know. I mean, how many of you have contributed to JCP? See, the number goes way low significantly. That's the point. So to build a standard, it really takes a village to build a JSR. Um, so any work that is delivered by a JCP community, I would always appreciate that. Um, criticism, yes, but make it make sure it's positive criticism. That okay, it was not done, but here is how it can be done. Here is how the proposal should look like. Here is how the Java doc should look like. Any help that you can offer in JCP will will make it successful, you know, because we are all vested into it. So that's sort of your feedback for Java E8 we are looking at. Excellent. Any more questions for the audience? No. Um, so I can't go. Um, so is there any um, any plans on NoSQL coming in? Java, no, right? so no. Just the the NoSQL, no. We talked about that explicitly and kind of kicked it out. Uh, NoSQL landscape is pretty wide. I mean, yeah. What is NoSQL? Is Hadoop NoSQL? Is Mongo NoSQL? Is Couch NoSQL? What is NoSQL? That's still unclear. And then um, <clears throat> there is no common thread between these NoSQL databases, so to say. You know, I mean, they have all have their own drivers, and they all sacrifice some capability of asset to be no SQL. Um, rather, they're more like base. I don't know what that base acronym stands for, but that, those are the characteristics we can talk about for no SQL. So it's very hard to put a common API. Um, most of this no SQL, by nature, they don't have an SQL ability. So what do you want to know SQL for? And most of them, most of the times, actually in pretty much all the cases, their native drivers are pretty good. And that's how customers have been using it. So we talked about that explicitly and ruled it out. Yeah, so the 
I guess we're seeing things like with hybrid OGM, we're starting to see sort of generic way of interface. I think that's pretty early days, really, isn't it? Very early, very early, and I've played with it because pretty much the moment you want any sophistication, any sophistication, you right away tap into the underlying driver. So I'm not sure, uh, and there's Eclipse Link mechanism as well, and there are a couple of other efforts on those lines. So I'm not sure if they're going to really solve the need. Yeah, was that the case with GPA though originally? Because you could, you know, you could drop down into Hibernate on a regular basis for anything that was outside of the kind of the, the norm. No, see, Hibernate is again is just a persistence provider. Uh, we're talking of a different analogy here. Yeah, you, yes, you're right. We're talking about GPA and right. underlying right. databases. Got it. Yeah, of course. Because all those databases are providing asset properties. There's no need to drop into them. You just say ABC is my layer. You give me that type four database driver. There are 700 databases in the world. They all provide the ABC four driver. I'm going to build my JPA on top of that. That's yeah, not the case with more, MySQL. It's much more sound footing, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I think it's the abstraction, isn't it? Yeah. Right. The abstractions for yeah. those databases that you talked about are exactly. completely different. Yeah. So what would the API, I mean, I can't, you can't, it's difficult to envisage the API beyond well, graph, key value pairs. Graph, graph, key value, column. tabular, yeah, yeah. column, graph. So, so you, yeah. Exactly. So you, what's your Five lowest seven. common denominator is probably exactly. key value, isn't it? Okay, so you, you end know. up with your key right. and you kind of go, well, that's a bit, that's a bit. Or like, oh, you, oh, you, you have a different, or you have a different <coughs> area of the stack for each group. Well, that's what you do, but the then you kind of go, how do you group them? Columnar yeah. databases, but well, they're not all yeah, quite well, the same, are they? Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Document databases, even there, are they, yeah, yeah. you know, some I mean, of them, they've got I've been studying the Hornet's Nest for the past couple of years, but then I gave up on it because, you know, I, I got the point that it doesn't make sense to try and dive Yeah, yeah. yeah so one of the things I've kind of tried to do in the past is have like a have MongoDB at the back end, and then have a REST service serving up JSON. The MongoDB is kind of mm -hmm. serving up JSON. Yeah, it's close. And then, so I'm basically querying MongoDB, getting something yeah. in a different API dealing with JSON, and then maybe using Jackson or something to convert it to something <coughs> that uh, JaxRS can return. Right. Or maybe manipulate it at some point right. as well. It would be really nice if that was just like, quite fluid straight from the. What would be, well, see, two points. First of all, how many times it happens they're using MongoDB? And then you say, oh, I'm going to switch to CouchBase now. I'm going to switch to Hadoop now, because that's an OSQL. Yeah. That's not going to happen in this case. Yeah. Because so, or I'm going to switch to Redis or React. That's not going to happen in this case. Very different use cases. In case of RD BMS, yes, that's more likely to happen, because hey, they all serve type 4 JDBC driver. So that's very likely to happen. Now, to simplify JSON binding, instead of relying upon proprietary Jackson and things like that, Hopefully, JSON binding will help over there. Yeah. So when JSON binding spec comes up, then you could say, oh, by the way, you're going to read the document from Mongo as JSON binding POJO object. Then I'm going to manipulate the POJO object. What's under underlying wire format? I don't care about it. Just put out the POJO object, and then somebody underlying is going to marshal or unmarshal the object for me. That would hopefully make it a little bit more fluent. That's what I wanted to do. Right. And that's what I needed to use Jackson for. Right. It wasn't so for now, Jackson, yeah. hopefully JSON binding in Java EA time frame. Yeah. OK. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, so I think that was everything I wanted to, questions that I had for you. Um, How you many know? of you use JBAS today? Oh, well, for okay. What other application servers are being used? It's OK. Don't be shy. <laughs> It's JBug, but what other application servers are being used? WebLog how many of you use WebLogic? How many of you use WebSphere? OK. How many of you use GlassFish? OK. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, with Java 7 definitely give Wildfly, Wildfly a try. Um, all the features are implemented over there. Red Hat is fully behind it. Uh, we are working on the EAP 7 release. Um, so you use the open source version today. When it's ready for production, you will have EAP 7 for you. you you'll be able to switch over to it. And it's the same. It's the same code base as well, which is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, 99.99% uh, is the same code base, which is a big, big difference, unlike Glassfish WebLogic or Liberty Profile WebSphere, which are two completely different code bases. So that's the big difference here, because the way EAP is cut is you take Wildfly, say, 8.4, whatever, I'm just taking the number, 8.5 or 8.6, whatever version you pick, and say, I'm going to make it product now. And then you make it go through certification, performance testing, 
there might be some pixels that may be made into EMP first, but then eventually they do make it to the community-based version as well. So, uh, but 99.99% of the core is very much same. So that's the big advantage here, because, because then you have the confidence. That to me is a big thing. And another new feature that we will introduce in Wildfly is patching. So for example, you can say, I'm on Wildfly 8, my applications are deployed, my configuration is managed, everything is defined over there very clearly. Now all I need to do is 8.1 is available, but I don't want to clean slate from 8.1. Then you say, just apply the patch to 8.0 and upgrade to 8.1. So the application configuration, resources, etc. stay as is. Some cool features in Wildfly for that. All right, well, that was fun. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, and thanks for everyone who came, and thank you for those watching remotely. Uh, we'll sign off now, and hope to see you in the next yearbook on, on Wildfly 8. Cheerio.